this is my wife, Rachel. Hello. And uh, we're going to obviously be looking at work-life balance relationships, so I'm going to hand over to Yeah, the boss. welcome to the boss. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, welcome this morning. Um, we, we're guessing that probably a lot of you here are married. Um, some of you will have children. Some of you might not be married might not have children. Some of you might have little children. Some of you might have grown-up children. And so we were wanting to speak sort of in general principles. Um, but obviously, because, it's, uh, because of the topic being work-life balance, we're going to be drawing on a lot of our own experience um, of juggling life, marriage, church, ministry, parenting, etc. So um, there'll, there'll be a bit of that in there as well. Um, Tim and I have been married for just over seven years, and we've got three um, lovely little children. We've got Phoebe, who's four, um, Simeon, who's two, and Lois, who's one. And as you know, Tim uh, works at HTB as the director of worship. He also heads up Worship Central, and he's training to be a vicar at the moment as well. Um, I am a stay-at-home mum. Uh, I used to work in television production, what feels like a very long time ago, and um, two years actually before our daughter was born, I, I left my job there and came and worked at HTB, involved in their video and creative department. And, um, and really, actually, when I left for maternity leave, I knew that that chapter was closed. It, was a, it felt like a, a good ending. It was a good decision. And, um, and we made the choice together that I would be at home. That would be my role. I'd be at home with the children. Um, and actually, now I'm involved on a voluntary basis in heading up a ministry called MOLO, very catchy name, I think, which stands for Mums of Little Ones. And um, I do that, as I said, on a voluntary basis, sort of in the evenings. I have one afternoon dedicated to that. And that's really a ministry to serve mums a bit like me who've got small children um, and getting them involved in the life of the church. So in short, like probably for most of you, life is pretty full on. Um, there's a lot going on. In fact, more than it feels that we're able to give our attention to um, than we have hours in the day. So how on earth do we balance all of that? Um, I should say from the very beginning <laughs> that Tim and I have definitely not always got the balance right. Um, we've certainly made mistakes, and there have been times in our married life when we've both been aware that that balance has not been good. Times when we've been tired and stressed out and pushed to the very limits of our own resources and Often it's because we haven't prioritized well. We've let people down, usually each other. Um, but I don't know about you, but we've seen or heard about one too many marriages that have fallen apart due to the pressures of ministry, sadly, and, and life. And kids who have grown up distant from their parents or who are disillusioned with the church. And we don't want that to happen to us. Um, we're determined to try and set things in place so that that doesn't happen, and yet we're acutely aware that we're all fallible. We're, we're human, and we make mistakes. So the subtitle for this um, little session is How to Do Ministry Without Screwing Up Your Family. Over to you, Tim. <laughs> um, a very wise guy once said to me that life, the gospel, is all about relationships. It's all about relationships, relationships with God, relationships with one another. And I guess for all of us who, whether you're working full-time for a church, or I imagine lots here are, you know, working, um, busy jobs, and then you're volunteering and serving in the church, doing worship and leading, and musicians, there's so much going on. And often, the thing that can get squeezed if we're not careful is the very thing we're called to, which is relationship. And again, that can be family, but you might be single and uh, you might find that there's a whole ton of relationships that are suffering as a result. When I used to work for Soul Survivor before Rach and I were married, I loved it, absolutely loved it. So excited, uh, amazing opportunity to travel, working with Mike Pilavarchi and a fantastic team. And it's just it's such amazing times. Um, but I sometimes 
looking back, I realized I messed up. I didn't get the balance right. And I know at times I was so focused on working and traveling and church and ministering that actually I, I, I hurt some of the people that I loved most, my, my family, my parents, my, my brothers and some close friends. And I realized that I, I just missed some of the points of what, what actually are the really important things. And uh, it comes down to, I guess, priorities. And Nicky Gumbel, who, um, again, is, is an amazing man, an amazing leader, he, he once sat me down and he said, you know, he, uh, someone told him once that actually, in terms of priorities, he thinks this is the way you should order your priorities. And I, I've always found this, we've found this very helpful, that our first priority is always God. We're created for God. That's first and foremost. But our second priority, if you're married, it's for your spouse, your husband or your wife, that you love them, that you put them before anything else. Your third priority, if you have children, is children. And then your fourth priority is your work. If you're working teacher, a researcher, a, um, doctor, nurse, whatever, that's your fourth priority. And then your fifth priority is ministry. Serving the church, all that you do to serve uh, the local church. And often I think we get those mixed up. And I know certainly I have. And I think sometimes what we do is we, we think that ministering and serving the church, serving God through you know, giving time to um, be involved in the worship team or, or whatever it is, is a higher priority than our family. And so we're going to look a bit at, at that. And we're going to kind of base this talk around those five points um, and as I said, some of you here, you might not be married or you might not have kids. So some of these points might not be relevant for you for now, but they could be relevant for you in years to come. And actually, there are principles here for all of us, whatever stage of life we're at. And also, as we talk about these priorities, I think it is important to state sometimes I think we can try and pursue. And um, maybe you're thinking this is going to help you find that really nice, neat and tidy balance so that every day, every week is kind of perfectly lined up with all these priorities just doesn't work like that. You know, when we're talking about these priorities, it's not necessarily about time, that we have a kind of really uh, complicated graph at home that works out exactly how many hours I've spent with Rachel and make sure I've spent a couple more hours with Rachel than I have with the kid. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. It's about um, our hearts, what we're, we're sort of investing our energies. And there'll be seasons. You know, there, there are seasons when you work or you're part of a church where... It's really, really busy. For example, you know, maybe Christmas time, you've got Christmas carol services, you've got a whole bunch of stuff going on, and you might find yourself just working really, really hard towards that event or that big conference or, or whatever it is. And so you, you might find you're just really going for it, and that's fine. But I think there needs to be then times where there's a, an opportunity to catch up. So f for us, you know, the last few months have been absolutely nuts, you know, with every, everything we're trying to fit in. It's been crazy. But w the way we try and do it is to make sure when things calm down, we can catch up, maybe get a, a weekend away or just get some downtime, take a few days off together as a family, and just kind of catch up with time. So I don't think it's necessarily about trying to find a, a, a perfect week where everything's in order. I think actually a lot of it comes down to seasons, seasons where you're very, very busy, but then seasons where you can catch up and catch your breath. And seasons perhaps in your marriage where you're not seeing each other as much as you'd like, but then making sure you're having time to sort of readdress the balance. So we're going to look at that. But the first priority, briefly, because I think we spoke about this a lot last night, is, is the priority of God. That first and foremost, we're worshippers, we're sons and daughters of the living King. And, and we need to find our identity, our security in Him uh, before our identity is whatever it is we do for a living or whatever role we play in our worship teams. And I was really struck by this. Uh, Matt Redman, who's going to be here this afternoon, he uh, speaks about a season where he, he very severely um, bust his, his hand, his wrist. He had um, repetitive strain injury, whatever that thing is. It hurts. Um, and let me, I'll read what he writes. He says, uh, after this kind of injury, he basically the doctor said, you can't play guitar for, um, I think it was, it, was a, it was about two months, it was quite a long time, where he was completely out of action in terms of leading worship. 
Actually, here we go. For the next uh, seven weeks, I could hardly do anything. And most frustratingly of all, I couldn't play my guitar. I sat at home with loads of questions buzzing around in my head. Why was this happening? Would my arm ever fully recover? Was it the devil? Was it God? I didn't really know or have the theological answers, but I soon realized that whatever the answers to those questions, God was at work in the situation. He started to speak to me. As a servant, I was dispensable. Servants come and go, and God can choose any of us to do any job in his kingdom. As a worship leader, I was replaceable. God could use anyone for the events that we'd been privileged to be a part of. But as a child of God, I was indispensable. There would never be another me. A child is irreplaceable. And so our priority of our relationship with God and that operating out of the security of knowing who we are, whose we are, that is so key because if we don't get that right, then in terms of balance, in terms of, in terms of health, in terms of uh, sustainable ministry and fantastic relationships for the long haul, we're going to struggle. So um, God is absolutely key. He is our primary relationship. So how do we do that? Um, we're all different, different personalities, um, different seasons of life, and certainly for us, building that relationship with God, finding those daily connection points with God has looked different as the seasons have changed. Um, but the key is connecting with God every day, and it doesn't really matter what that looks like. I read this on a blog by Christine Kane the other day. I simply ensure that each day I connect with God, but I'm not legalistic about how that happens. In whatever way you like to connect with God, connect. The issue is never how. If you like to journal, journal. If you like to sing, then sing. If you like to read, then read. If you like to sit on a rock, then sit on a rock. If you have a daily routine that works, then keep it. If you have an erratic schedule, then make time. Connecting with God is a heart issue, not a behavioral issue. And it looks different in everyone's lives. We are not robots. And while we can be inspired by each other, we ultimately have to do what works for us. We live different lives and are in different seasons, have different schedules, and hold different responsibilities. There is no normal. Tim and I live under the same roof, um, but we're very different. And we have different schedules, different pressures. And certainly for me, since having children, the challenge to find that connection point with God every day um, has been tricky. Certainly when my babies were really little, um, newborns, there was a lot of sitting down and feeding. And I was knackered. I was absolutely exhausted, really sleep deprived. And sometimes the only conscious connection point I would make with God would be sitting on a chair, feeding my baby, and I would sing very badly worship songs to God. Often I would murder Tim's songs. I could sort of hear him wincing down the corridor. But it was the only thing I had to give. And um, that I really met God in those times of being tired. But that, that was it. I, I couldn't pick up my Bible, to be honest. But I could sing. And so that's what I did. But now I'm in a season where my kids are just a little bit older and they're sleeping through the night, just about. And I can, I can set my alarm to be up before they are, and I can spend some time with God then. And it's a killer, I'll be honest. But I know that if, if I'm not making those connection points with God consciously every day, everything suffers. It's so different when I'm in a rhythm, not necessarily routine, just a rhythm of finding time to be with God every day. So that's really the encouragement um, if we want our foundations to be set, if we want our identity to be, to be uh, set in being a child of God, then we, we ha it's simple, isn't it? We all, we all know it. Um, it's kind of the basics, but we have to find time to consciously connect with God every day. Actually, Tim very cheekily stole something from me yesterday. In his talk, he mentioned... Um, a little thing that he'd heard Heidi Baker say. I had that in this talk, and I read him the notes yesterday morning, and he nicked it and put it in his talk last night. But we didn't we say, what's mine is yours. <laughs> I inherited your student debt. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hang on a second. I actually can't believe that Tim just dragged up my student debt. Wow. 
Wow. New depths, Tim, new depths. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to say it again because I think it's really good. Um, Heidi Baker said in a talk um, that we heard over the summer, greater intimacy leads to greater fruitfulness. Greater intimacy leads to greater fruitfulness. For us, that was just so profound that we can get so caught up in doing, in action, in being at every meeting, at um, doing everything on our to-do list. Um, but unless we are finding connection points with God, consciously connecting with God every day, what's the point? What's the point? And in fact, you know, it's that, that amazing economy of the kingdom of God that actually when we take time out of doing and just find time to be with God, often our fruitfulness is that much greater. And don't we all want our lives to be fruitful? So the next one is spouse. The next priority is spouse. So over to Tim. As I mentioned, uh, obviously I've got to be very careful what I uh, say here. And you're probably thinking Rachel's written this part of the talk for me. But um, my priority after God, I believe biblically, is Rachel. My, my relationship with Rachel. That before um, anything else, when you get married, you make these vows to, to honor that person, to love that person, to, to, to live together um, forever with that person. And I think sometimes we can get confused because actually when we talk about church work, we can think, well, that's God's work. That's God's stuff. So that's got to be more important. But actually, marriage, family, relationship, that's also God's stuff, kingdom stuff. And we must never, ever um, make the mistake of thinking church activity is more important than any other activity. We're part of the kingdom of God. And uh, I heard an amazing talk by a guy called Andy Stanley. He's a, a pastor in America, a church, large church in Atlanta. And he, he shared a time in his life where he just planted a church. He had two young children and his wife was pregnant with their third child. And life was really, really full and busy. And he was giving everything he had to try and plant this church, to really get it up and going. You know, high hopes, huge vision for it. So he never felt he had enough time to really do everything he wanted for the church. And then he'd come home and he was giving himself, you know, young family, busy, you know, lots and lots to do, lots of, um, you know, fun and mess. And, and again, he never felt he was quite giving enough time to his family. So he, he was living in this constant tension of feeling like I'm totally letting the church down and I'm totally letting my family down. And pretty quickly he came to a point where he realized, actually, if I'm going to keep doing this, for not just a couple of years, but like decades. Something has to change. And he also spoke about, uh, very honestly, about this sense of being gripped by fear. This kind of fear that I think sometimes we can have when it comes to ministry, that if I don't build this thing, if I don't do it, God won't. He says this, let me read. The real issue is I was not sure God could be trusted to build as big a church as I wanted him to build. I wasn't really sure that God's will for my life synced up with my will for my life. I so relate with that. Sometimes we have high hopes for our worship team, our songwriting, our whatever it is. And the fear is, God, do you have that same view? And, you know, the fear of actually allowing God to take control. It's, it's very, very hard. And so anyway, he reached this head at this point where he just realized he couldn't go on and he spoke to his wife and he said, look, when is the time of your day that you're most stretched and exhausted? And she said, bath and bedtime. You know, by sort of 4.30, 5 o'clock, I am done in. He said, I'm ready to throttle kids, to, you know, do lots of <laughs> bad things because I'm just exhausted. And uh, he said, okay, well, I'm going to make sure I come back for that time. And he, he made this commitment. He said, God, I can give you 45 hours in a week to, to work and serve the church, but that's all. And I'm going to prioritize my wife and my family. And so he, um, and he had this phrase which he, he shared, he shares with all, all his leaders. He says, cheat the church, not your family. Cheat the church, not your family. And so he started to do this at four o'clock every day. He would leave the office and he'd get back for bath time to be with his wife. 
and his family. And of course, it was a difficult transition for some of the church and the staff. You know, what are you doing? But actually, what happened was he realized if I've got 45 hours, I can only do the things I feel I'm really gifted at. So he kind of focused on his priorities, his gifts. Also, the whole church and the team developed a sense of trust that God, this is your church. You need to build it. You know, now that church has over 25,000 members and he hasn't changed any of his practices. He's allowed God to take the lead. And he um, speaks about, you know, Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus says, Jesus' words, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus will build his church. It's not dependent on you. It's not dependent on me. Going back to that thing Matt Redmond said, we are all as workers, as musicians, as servants of the church, we are all dispensable. God can find others to use us. Jesus is the one who will build his church. We get to be a part of it. But Jesus ultimately built the church. And then, you know, in terms of for me as a husband, the verse in Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. God never commands me to build the church. But he does call and he commands me to love my wife. And uh, again, Andy Stanley, he says this. When I look at these two concepts, these two verses, and I put them together, it freed me up. Because I was never commanded to love the church. I was commanded to love my wife. And I was never commanded to build the church. Jesus promised he would build the church. But somehow in ministry we get these things confused so easily. We say, I'm going to go and build the church. Meanwhile, God, I need you to watch over my family. So for us as a couple, as a family, the way that practically worked out um, is I always leave the office at 5 p.m. I get on my bike. I cycle home. I'm back for 5.30 to be at home to do uh, tea time, bath time, to be there with the kids before they go to bed, which is such a special time as a family. And it's a way of priority, prioritizing Rachel. Actually, more than, sort of, even more perhaps than being with the kids, it's a way to say, Rachel, I love you so much, and I love you that I want to do the best for you, to make sure I can support you when you're perhaps most exhausted. You know, I, I, I want you to thrive. I want to see you, uh, the best in you, And I want to support you. And sometimes I can catch myself and I see it as selfishness. And this hunger and pursuit for success, often at the expense of those key relationships. I want to be the best worshiper. I want to be the best songwriter. I want to be the best leader. And we we just go for it, we go for it, we go for it. And what we do is we spiritualize it. Well, God's called me. This is what God wants. I'm serving people, I'm, I'm serving him. And it, it kills me. You know, I've traveled all over the world. I've met lots and lots of leaders and worship leaders. I've seen so many marriages, families fall apart because people made bad choices. They put church above family. And they justified it. And they're sort of on a stage doing all this ministry whilst at home their wives or their husbands are just dying. We mustn't do ministry at the expense of our family. Final thing, and then I'm going to hand back to Rach. There's a Ugandan bishop, um, Festo Kivengeri. That's probably a horrendous translation. Um, And he tells a story of, he was just about to go to speak at a big, big rally, thousands of people. And uh, just before he's leaving, him and his wife had a bit of an argument. And he left the house by saying something really unkind to her. And he got in the car and he felt bad, but he was running late. He had to rush off. And as he's going, he's praying, Lord, bless this event. Pray that thousands would be impacted by your spirit. And as he's praying, you just feel God saying, what about your wife? He said, oh, sorry, Lord. Just yeah, look after my wife. And he felt God say, no, you need to go back and apologize. You are out of order. And he's like, well, God, look, time, you know, thousands of people. I, I need to. And so he really felt that God say to him, okay, here's the deal. You go on to this rally, I'm going to go back, hang with your wife. <laughs> and so he turned the car around, he went and apologized, he got right, and then he went to the event and it was amazing. God is wanting us to build relationships that will last, that will bring the best out of one another, 
that we're not ditching our mates at the expense of a bit more ministry. Because relationship is what we're made for. When um, Tim and I first got together, I was dealing with, I think Tim sort of alluded to it, quite an independent person. Um, Tim had been doing lots of traveling around and leading worship, lots of different places, and I become pretty independent. And um, actually, Tim and I got engaged, and we were planning our wedding during an event called Soul in the City. Does anyone remember Soul in the City? It was a big mission in London um, involving 11,000 young people, and it was, it was pretty intense. And I was also planning a, a wedding, as I said. Tim was heading up the worship side of things for this mission, and I'd actually come on board to help a bit with uh, the media and the PR side of things. So it was an intensely busy time, and Tim and I at that um, during that whole phase, really had to fight hard to find time together. Um, and I was also adjusting to being the other half of Tim Hughes. Um, with what Tim does, he often has to stand on a stage in front of hundreds of people. And naturally, people become interested in who he is, you know, what, what he's like. And, and um, I have to be honest, I was getting a bit sick and tired of only being known as Tim Hughes's fiance. And rather confidently, I felt like there was a little bit more about me than that. And I was also keen that Tim appreciated that I had, I'd left a, a job at the BBC, something that I really loved in order to, for us to work together. More to the point, a job where nobody knew who Tim Hughes was. <laughs> and I was really... Thank you. <laughs> I was really keen that our lives didn't become, uh, didn't start to revolve around everything that Tim did and everything that he was involved in. I should point out that Tim is one of the most humble people I know. It wasn't his attitude, um, but more the environment that we were in. Anyway, I had been asked to do a radio interview as part of this PR job for um, yeah, a, a radio station. Now, radio interviews are something that Tim's really used to. He does, he does a lot of them. But for me, it was quite a new thing. I was a bit nervous. I was anxious to get it right. And I was also very keen that Tim was listening, you know, to support me and help me and give me some feedback, that sort of thing. Anyway, this, um, this, this radio interview was scheduled for a Saturday morning. And so I had to make a special trip into the office um, to, it was a phone interview, so that I could do the interview over the phone. Um, Tim knew when the interview was happening, what the radio station was, and he was at his house. So I went into the office, phone rang, did the interview, and, you know, I thought it had gone pretty well, and um, hung up the phone, and I, I waited for Tim to call me. Nothing. No phone call thought, that's a bit strange. Waited a couple more minutes and thought, oh, he's got distracted or something. You know, I'm quite stubborn, so, so I'm, I'm not going to phone him. I'll wait for him to phone me. So um, 20 minutes later, no phone call. So I eventually relented and I picked up the phone and phoned Tim's number and he picked up the phone, very breezy. Hi, babe. Like, silence from me. Hello, you all right? Yes. Uh, what, what have you been up to? Oh, you know, I've just been playing on the PlayStation with Rob. That's his, that was his housemate at the time. Ah, oh, silence from me. And um, what, what's the time? What? Uh, oh, the time is... Oh, no! Babe, I'm so... And then I just hung up the phone. <laughs> I know, very immature. Not, yeah, not the best response. And of course, Tim phoned immediately back, but I, I was too furious <laughs> to pick up the phone. In fact, I switched my phone off for about an hour and just let him sweat it out because <laughs> I was not a happy bunny. I, couldn't, I, I just couldn't believe that he wouldn't be, be listening. Anyway, eventually I sort of cooled down a little bit and switched my phone on, and Tim made his 17th desperate attempt to get in touch with me. And I picked up the phone... And all I could think to say, now these words have gone down in the history of our relationship, are, you know, right now, I'm not even sure I want to marry you. Because either 
you're inherently selfish, or you just don't give up. And at that point, I did actually use a rude word, which I won't repeat here. Um, and neither were an attractive prospect to me right now. Um, yeah, I'm quite tough, aren't I? I realize that. You need to warm to me. I'm not a horrible person, I promise. Anyway, Tim was very apologetic, and we realized that there was stuff that we needed to work through. My swearing habit was one of those things. <laughs> and, um, and thankfully, things have changed a lot since then, and we're, we're on great terms. I have forgiven him, as you, as you can see. <laughs> But like I said, I think we have learned a lot since then. And I don't hang up the phone anymore. That's the other thing I've learned. But being a mum at home is um, a pretty hidden season. I don't know whether there are any other stay-at-home mums here or spouses of mums with small children. But it's quite humbling, um, hidden. And, and yet being at home with the kids is something that we chose together as a couple that doesn't make that choice always easy um, in the day-to-day. -day. I know it is such a privilege to be a mum. I don't want to take that for granted for one single second. But when I left for maternity leave, um, Tim and I were working together. I was ch part of the church life here. I felt sort of right in the thick of things. Um, I felt like I had a role to play. And leaving that behind was really hard. Um, don't get me wrong, like I said, I would not give up being a mum for anything, but the sacrifices have been big, and the hours are very long, and the rewards are few in the day-to-day. -day. And at times over the last few years, I've had moments of being pretty disgruntled. It's felt like, at times, Tim gets all the good bits. You know, he gets to go off, do what he loves, get to church, see God move, and I feel like... I'm at home changing pooey nappies a lot of the time. Sometimes I feel like I'm missing out. And I know it's not always easy for Tim either. But being a worship widow on a Sunday, as Liv Gordon and I sometimes call it, can sometimes be tough. Church can sometimes feel more like a logistical operation, just getting to church, rather than a place where I can soak in the presence of God. I've sometimes got bitter resentful, angry towards Tim, angry that he gets to do all that he does. But on the other hand, I am intensely proud of Tim. I am his loyalist fan and his fiercest defender. And I'm starting to learn that life is all about seasons. And even in the season that I'm in now, God has so much to teach me so much that he wants to do in my life. And I'm trusting that God and Tim haven't forgotten that there are still passions and dreams buried deep in my heart that won't be fulfilled in this season right now. And that there's grace for my little outbursts every now and again. And at times I think Tim hasn't quite known how to respond to my feelings because there is no easy fix. We made the choice for our lives to look like this in this season. And of course he has his own callings and responsibilities, but the key is to prefer each other. To, and for me, to prefer Tim means that I am actively involved in what he's involved in, that I'm, I'm interested in all that's going on that I can support him, that I can encourage him, that I can pray for him, that I can spur him on to be everything that God is calling him to be right now. And for Tim, I think that means appreciating the sacrifice that I make at the moment to be a mum at home, to encourage, those, to encourage me in those small and seemingly trivial things that no one else sees, no one else knows about, to fight for me, to have times where I can just step out of the mundane every now and again. To pray for me, to spur me on to be all that I can be in Christ. As well as that, I think we need to remember that we're not just housemates. We're not just parents to our children, but we are husband and wife. And we need to nurture that relationship. We need to be finding times to regularly put aside all the other roles and responsibilities that we play in our day-to-day -day life and just have fun together. 
to find times to be together, to enjoy our, each other's company, to go out, to stay in, to be romantic, to find ways to love each other. Tim and I um, did the marriage course at church a couple of years ago. I think it was just, I think we were, I was pregnant with our second son at the time. And it was such a great thing to do. We rallied round a bunch of babysitters and um, we were able to do this course. And I can't recommend it highly enough. If your church runs the marriage course and you're not doing, you haven't done it yet, go and do it. Go and run the marriage course if you haven't got it at your church. Or if you live nearby to HTB, come and do it here. It is such a valuable thing to do as a married couple. And one of the best pieces of advice that we took from the marriage course was the concept of date night. And the ideal is that once a week, you set aside a date night. Now, be honest, it doesn't always happen once a week, but probably at least once every other week. And it's just a chance to be together where you make a decision to switch off the TV and put away the laptop and, and talk to each other. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? And... Um, that doesn't have to be sort of expensive meals out, although that can be nice once in a while. Hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's pretty good at that. And, you know, it, it can just be a walk by the river, a romantic coffee, something. A, a, again, a conscious decision to spend time with each other. I know like, when our babies were really little and getting a babysitter in, what, you know, wasn't practical just a takeaway with the TV switched off and, and a decision to have a, a good conversation was enough to sustain us. So be intentional. The key is to plan ahead. Put it in your diary. And so if some, something else comes in for that particular slot, you say, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Put it in the diary. Date night. One of the best things you can do as a married couple. And interestingly, which leads on to our next one, um, most parenting experts are all agreed that one of the best ways that you can build a sense of security for your children is by loving your spouse well. So the next priority is children. And as I alluded to, having kids kind of turned our lives upside down just a little bit in the most beautifully, wonderfully chaotic way possible. And I thank God every day for, our three, for the three beautiful little children that he has given us. And I pray about 20 times a day that he will help us parent them well. John Piper um, said this, the crucible for refining my soul is marriage and family, even more so than the challenges of ministry. I'm sure some of you here have probably got teenagers and you're thinking, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> but for us, our four years of being parents has taught us more about ourselves than anything else. And at times it has really stretched us to the very limits. And one particularly stretching day happened, ironically, at the end of a, a pretty miserable holiday, actually, we'd had in, in Cornwall. The holiday had been miserable because it had rained every single day. We don't do well in Cornwall for some reason. And um, our kids had got hand, foot and mouth disease, which is really awful. It's really, really painful. And it means that they have these little blisters in their mouth. Anyway, so we'd packed up the car. We had two, two, our two little ones at the time, and they were in the back of the car, and they were really tired, poorly, not happy, and it was raining, surprise, surprise. So we'd set off on our five-hour journey home, and um, my daughter, Phoebe, just started screaming, which set off my son, Simmy. He was screaming. They were both screaming, 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 screaming. And we, you know, we tried to calm them down. And they were, so eventually we were driving about 70 miles an hour on the, I was driving on the dual carriageway. And they just dropped off to sleep. And so had Tim. And suddenly this dog just wanders out from the hard shoulder into the middle of the road. And I've got about 10 seconds to make a decision. I'm in the slow lane. There's nothing else on the road, so that's okay. But I'm thinking, okay, I, I'm, I moved out into the fast lane thinking this dog is going to look up and realize that it's like on a main road and turn back. But oh no, this dog just 
kept coming. And so we're on this collision course by now, and I'm at 70 miles an hour. And I remember vaguely sort of in the back of my mind that the worst thing you can do is slam on your brakes and swerve. So I just hit this dog, bang on. I actually decapitated the dog. So now, I know that's dreadful, isn't it? The only reason I know that is because when the police guy turned up, I had to pull over the car, front of our car was totally total. I said, I felt terrible about this dog. And I said, you know, did the dog have a collar? And the policeman looked at me and said, well, its body is here, but its head is about 50 meters up that way. I know, isn't that terrible? Anyway, our kids were screaming, screaming again. We sorted things out with the police. Our car was okay enough to drive. So we carried on driving. And, and Phoebe just screamed and screamed and screamed the whole... I mean, nothing we could do would stop her scream. We think she'll fall asleep. She'll fall asleep any time. We were getting really stressed, Tim and I. And eventually we decided we're going to have to pull into a service station because, you know, this is like bordering on you know, something bad. So we pulled into this service station, still raining. Sim opts for Simeon, who's pretty calm, leaves me to, to get Phoebe. So I get Phoebe out of the car. She is screaming hysterically. <clears throat> and we walk in to the service station. Tim then takes Simeon off for a nappy change. And I'm standing, holding Phoebe in my arms, screaming, screaming. And I suddenly realize everyone's looking at me. And she starts shouting, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And it dawns on me that they don't realize that I'm her mummy. They're thinking I'm some strange woman who's stolen this child, this hysterical child. And we're in the middle of nowhere in the service station. And they're expecting to see my face show up on Crime Watch that night or something. So anyway, we abandon the service station, back out into the car, more screaming, more hysterical screaming. And um, we're about half an hour from home, thank goodness. And Tim thinks, I know, we'll put on some worship music. Let's put on some worship music, calm them down. I'm like, no, that won't work, because we're, you know, we're really not liking each other either by then. So Tim wins, he puts on his <laughs> worship music. No, I didn't. That was... <laughs> Just happened to be in the car. Just, ha just happened to be there. And there's, there's silence for about five seconds, and Tim gives me this, <laughs> told you, <ya>, look. <laughs> and then my daughter Phoebe pipes up. I don't like singing, and I don't like daddy's songs. <laughs> and at that point, we both just fell about laughing. As I said, some days being parents are quite stretching. Um, but the truth is, Tim and I come from great families. We're so fortunate in that respect. And we've had parents who set for us great foundations. And I realize we've only been parents four years. So, you know, apart from screaming incidents and a few toddler tantrums, we've got a lot to learn. But we are determined to set those good habits in place, to create good foundations and rhythms for our family. So here are just a really quick couple of thoughts. Days off together. We really want to prioritize days off together. And Tim mentioned that it's about seasons. And for us, Tim does a working week of Sunday through to Thursday. So Friday and Saturday are our weekend. But probably two weekends in every month are affected by work, either a conference or trips away, that sort of thing. So I safeguard. I'm pretty ruthless when it comes to our days off together and um, really try to fight for those. Because I know at the end of the day, my kids love daddy being around. And we only have so much credit in the bank with kids. You know, even if you've been on this amazing two-week holiday together, a month later they're like, okay, I want to hang out with you some more. You know, they, they sort of forget about all the credit that you've built up. So I think for us, we try and take things a month at a time. We sit down and we look at the diary. And if in any given month we've got less than two kind of uninterrupted family weekends together, then we need to talk. We need to readdress that balance. 
We also need to think about what happens on those days off together because home admin can really get in the way. And I've noticed that often for us, a bad day off together or a family day, as our kids call them, um, is not so much how much we've crammed in the week before, but how well we've planned our day off. The worst days off are when we don't plan anything. Tim wants to do something on the computer. I want, to, I want him, actually, to clean out the loft. You know, I'd like to Skype my sister in America, and the kids want our attention. So we really try on a day off to make sure that if we've got home admin that needs to be done, trip to the supermarket, whatever, at least one part of the day is spent 100% focused, like as a family, all together. So swimming, going to the park, anything, doesn't have to be expensive, just concentrated time as a family. Over to you, Tim. Final two things very briefly before we close. God, your spouse, your kids, and then work. For those of you who are in uh, full-time jobs or part-time jobs, it's never going to be a good witness um, if we're not really doing that with all our hearts. You know, if we're kind of using our time at work to do rotors and learn songs and you know, surf the web and Facebook. Actually, you know, that is part of our ministry. And one of the things we've been doing at HDB is, you know, often we have prayer meetings for a church and the the way often we do it is people gather and we pray for the church thing that's happening. You know, we've got a church event, let's all gather and pray for that. And the emphasis can be on the church activity. But a while ago, um, Nikki Gumbel really felt what we needed to do was to pray for the people actually ministering and doing mission work out in the, in the world, in businesses, all you know, different sort of areas. So what we do is once a month we ha- have a different kind, or actually every other week, a different area of business that we pray for. So I was leading the prayer meeting, or leading the worship at the prayer meeting on Tuesday, and uh, it's for everyone involved in kind of industry, um, telecommunications, and people who are doing that, coming together, we're praying for them. We have them for f- sort of fashion for doctors and medics, for uh, lawyers, for teachers, for people involved in sport, um, all of these different issues. And actually, these are the guys who are doing the ministry, doing the stuff, and we need to bless and honour them and pray that God would use them to be salt and light in those areas. And what an amazing opportunity to interact with people, to love people, to, to be Jesus to people, and to see change. So if you're involved in work, Um, I know it must be difficult, and I can't really speak from experience because my work is doing the church stuff. But for those, you know, I have huge admiration for balancing, you know, working and then also volunteering and serving in the church. But actually what you do uh, Monday to Friday or whatever it is you do is essential. And it is ministry. It's, It's about seeing God's kingdom breaking in. So work, forth, and then finally, church. Everything we're doing, serving the church. The church is the hope of the world. The church is not periphery to the world. It's at the center. And the church is what we need to love and serve and be a part of. Because it's through the church that we can really make an impact. That we can really see change. I was interested to hear you know, some of these leading politicians, leading kind of businessmen and thinkers and entrepreneurs who are kind of particularly pioneering things with like justice and <clears throat> you know these things like the one campaign and all of these things they're realizing that actually if we want to mobilize an army if we want to bring about significant change if we want to eradicate poverty then more important than sort of pulling in the celebrities pulling in the key business leaders they're realizing they need to pull in church leaders because the church have the resources, have the people, have the heart. It's our mission, it's our calling to serve the poorest of the poor. And so the church, I can't think of anything more exciting than to give ourselves to serving the local church. Anyway, there's a few thoughts. There's so much you could say about this subject. But I guess our heart and our desire really in putting this workshop on is that we believe passionately that God is about relationships, that one of the greatest 
uh, examples we could give to the world, that one of the greatest things we could do is to build healthy relationships, to build healthy families, you know, to raise up children who are secure, who are loved, who feel that they can do anything, to build healthy marriages that actually not only a blessing to the couple, but actually a blessing to others. You know, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? When you go to someone's house and it just feels like, home. It feels healthy. It feels alive. The, the amount of wholeness and ministry and healing and love that can happen through families like that is amazing. And I know it's a sensitive subject because many of us perhaps come from whether it's broken families or we've been a part of relationships that have broken down and we carry this pain. And the good news is God is about restoration. He is about healing. He's about fresh starts. And we're never out of the race. But actually, perhaps we need to put in place practices, disciplines, healthy attitudes, wise choices that mean we can build up amazing relationships that not only feed us, but that are amazing fun, but actually bless others. A couple of quick resources, just love to encourage you. One is the marriage book and the parenting book, which should all be in the bookshop at the back. Really, really helpful practical advice. Really encourage you to read those if you haven't. Also, um, I know Martin's leading worship next, but uh, meet Mr. S uh, Smith and meet Mrs. Smith. M Martin and Anna's books are really fantastic. Just to get an insight into doing family, doing life. Particularly Anna's book, if you want to really hear the dirt about Martin. It's fantastic. Really, it's really very good, that one. Yeah, I mean... The things he did, I mean... Shocking. No, no, no. no. It is, but it's, it's a really... It's, we, we've both read both of them. Um, it's very, very interesting and inspiring to see what God did through Delirious and through Martin and through Anna. But also it's profoundly honest, very moving, and just really, really helpful. If you're married, if you're trying to juggle work, worship, church, family. So again, they'll all be at the bookshop, so check those out. But why don't I quickly close by praying? Lord Jesus, thank you that you are about relationship. You came for the purpose of drawing us back into relationship with you. And I pray that you would help us in our relationships to love those that you've called us to do life with. For those who are married, that we would really honour our wives and our husbands. Those with kids, that we would love our kids. But Lord, for all of us, that you'd help us to, to find that rhythm of life. That means that we can thrive and not just survive. Amen.